So, when it comes to composting, should you turn or not turn? What do you think? That's what this video is all about. Stay tuned, coming up. When it comes to making compost, a lot of people want to pull out the pitchfork and just turn, 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 and make compost really quick. Should you actually do that? It depends. What are you going for? Before I update you on the whole turn versus no turn composting experiment that I have going on, let's go inside and look a little bit about the theory about why we're thinking about this in the way we are. What are we actually doing and what are we going for? When it comes to humans, I think one of the biggest traps we fall into is this never always. Like there's one right way to do something and you should never consider another way. I think we fall into that trap and I also think we don't think about context. Why are we actually doing something? So if we think about composting, one thing that you'll hear a lot of is you should always turn compost or it will always go anaerobic and that's always a bad thing. Or you should never leave a pile alone because it'll go anaerobic, that's bad. Or you should never turn a compost pile, it's too much time, it's too much effort. There's a lot of dogmatism. And what we're missing in this is the context. Why are we doing what we're doing? And what are you working with? What are our materials and what are our goals? Composting is no different. If we think about the experiment that I'm doing outside, the materials that I have to work with are wood chips. That's leaves and branches all ground up. So you have very mature, difficult to break down carbon, like lignans, and then you have easier to break down carbon, like the sugars in the leaves, all mixed into one pile. If you think about composting something different, say manure and food waste, there's not a lot of complex carbon in there. There might not be a lot of cellulose, there might not be a lot of lignin or keratin or some of the harder to break down carbon-based molecules. It might be easy to access sugars. We need to think about what we're composting when we think about how we're going to go about trying to break it down. And then we're going to need to think about what are we trying to actually create at the end of the day. In terms of what we're composting, we need to try and create the conditions to enable organisms to come into our pile and thrive to break down the materials that we've provided. So if you provide easy to access sugars, that's going to be simpler fungi, yeasts, molds, bacteria, quick decomposers. The primary decomposers are going to come in and break down those simple materials. If we're providing hard to break down materials like woody material, we're going to need our recalcitrant decomposers, stuff that can really break down the stuff that is resistant to decomposing in nature, the hard wood part of things. So by looking at our pile, we can already start to say, okay, well, there isn't a never and an always. Other than saying we should always think about what we've added to the pile when we think about our strategy. Because if we have easy to break down materials, then we can treat the pile differently. We can turn it more. We can aerate it more. Those easy to break down materials require fast acting organisms that require a lot of food, a lot of oxygen, they work quickly. That means turning the pile, providing them with more oxygen, with more water, with more access to food. Get them going, they're just going full speed. Turning speeds them up. Not turning slows them down and that's where the danger of anaerobic goes when you have a pile of say manure or grass clippings. The bacteria and quick acting fungi, the primary decomposers, want to break down the outside of the pile real fast. There's a lot of air that's fueling them. The center core doesn't have the air, so they can't work in there. So we turn that to eliminate the center core. But if you think about if we now made this pile of wood chips, we're not breaking down the same materials. They're different materials. And those wood chips are going to take a long time to break down. So are we really worried about the center core? Not as much. If you have a pile that takes 12, 18, 24 months to break down, do you care if the center core goes anaerobic for three or four months in the middle there? While the recalcitrant decomposers, the fungi that break down the tough lignans, keratins in the wood, 
do their work over years, you don't care about that anaerobic core. Maybe it's not optimum, but in the grand scheme of things, it's a small problem. You need fungi to establish themselves in this pile and you need the right fungi to establish themselves and proliferate to break down that woody material. If we turn it, we take all those hyphae that are forming and creating this mycelial web and we start cutting it up. Every time we turn, we're breaking those hyphae strands. So those decomposers have to start over and resend out hyphae. I mean, just intuitively, that makes sense, right? You're building a house, you frame the house. I come by overnight, I knock it to the ground, now you have a pile of two by fours and two by sixes. You gotta start over. I come knock it down again, you're starting over. You're not really ever making progress on getting that house built despite putting a lot of hours in. Same thing with these fungi. When you need them, to break down the hard to break down materials, give them the conditions they need to thrive. Oxygen into the pile, yet preserving their integrity. That's where this whole tube system came from, the vent tubes. That gives them the oxygen without ruining the structure of the pile, without hurting these strands. So the material that's here at the beginning can sit there all along and the fungi can just work through it. So when you're building your pile, think about the materials that you're breaking down. The harder they are to break down, the more woody, think the more mature, the longer that pile is going to need to sit undisturbed. Maybe you turn it at the beginning to break down the leaves and things like that, and then eventually you back off and stop turning. If it's wood chips, you're just going to need to let that pile sit. If it's grass clippings, you're going to want to turn it. You're not going to need the same fungi to break down oak trunk wood chips as you would to break down grass clippings. So think about your materials and then start thinking about your always never rule. What about our goals? What are we trying to create at the end of the day? Are we trying to create a bacterial rich compost or a fungal rich compost? Now there's no way of like knowing for sure that we can force more bacteria into the pile. But if we provide more foods that bacteria like or quick acting fungi like and we turn it and we provide those conditions, well inherently we're going to keep out those longer term decomposers. Similarly, if we do the opposite, if we want to provide a fungal decomposer pile, well we need to give them food and let them sit for a very long time. Now why might we want to do two different piles? If you think about the soil, what's going into the soil? Roots? Organisms are dying, maybe we're incorporating compost, there's mulches going on top, whether we're providing it or plants are just dying and falling on top. Are all the things in the soil, the roots, the mulches, the compost, are they all equal in terms of organic matter? No, they're all different. They're all at different maturities. They're all different carbon structures. If we're just putting table sugar all over the soil, well, we're going to get a whole bunch of bacteria that digest table sugar in our soil. If we just keep putting wood chips on, we're going to get a whole bunch of organisms that break down wood chips. Neither one's necessarily bad, but we're probably going to go out of balance one way or the other. In nature, in any meadow, in any forest, there's all different forms of carbon breaking down. So you can bet that those soils have all sorts of decomposers in there, primary, secondary, and the tertiary decomposers that break down the hard to digest compounds. Ideally, I'm thinking we want to create all of those organisms in our compost and add them to our soil. So we have this robust, diverse soil. If you always make your compost by turning it, and if you always make it out of grass clippings and manure, you're only going to be fostering a certain type of microbe and you're only going to be adding that to your soil. Then you're going to be relying on nature to kind of fill the gaps, what other organisms might be needed. Yes, they'll come in without you adding them, but you're not assisting that process or you might be sending that ratio way out of whack. You don't necessarily know what your starting soil is, but just adding more quick decomposers to your soil, if there's already a ton there, you might send your fungal to bacterial ratio way up on the bacteria side and way down on the fungal side. That might not be optimal. 
Similarly, if we only make slow compost, we might overload our soils to that and we might not have the organisms in there in the quantities and the ratios needed to help break down the short or the quick decomposing materials. You get where I'm going with this? Like nature has a cycle. Not everything that enters our soil as organic matter is at the same stage. There's mature and immature. We need organisms to break all that down. So I'm starting to think and trying to get you to think. And you tell me if I'm wrong here or if I'm on the right track. That we need to create different types of compost for our soils using different methods and different materials. That means you should do some slow turn compost or no turn compost and you should do some quick turn compost. And we should add all of it to our soil because we don't know what's there. We can't assume that we're always doing the right thing if we only do one thing. So why not give nature a bunch of tools to work with, a bunch of raw materials to work with, and let her sort it all out. So maybe, instead of always doing your compost the same way, you should never make your compost the same way, or you should always do a bunch of different piles using different methods, using different materials, and give your soil a bunch of microbes to work with. That's where I'm at with things. That's how my views are progressing and developing as I talk to more experts, as I read more, as I experiment more on my end. Opening up the lens a little bit, getting a broader view, trying to introduce more organisms, more diversity of organisms to our soil instead of just adding one thing or always the same thing. Let me know what you think about that in the comments below. But now let's get out of the classroom and get out into the field. It's enough talky talky. Let's get turny turny. Here we are now five days later and it's now time to turn the actively aerated pile. But before we do that, let's do some observations. Visually, all the piles look more or less the same as when they started. There might be some settling happening, but it's not apparent or obvious. Looking at temperatures using the reader here, the passively aerated pile right here, 86 degrees Fahrenheit. The actively aerated pile, which hasn't actually been aerated yet, 135. Both of these piles have held these temperatures for the past five days or so, and they really haven't changed. Maybe a degree up, a degree down here or there, but there hasn't been any sort of wild swing. Measuring the passive pile here, the control pile is coming in at 126 degrees. What I'm more gonna be interested in during this trial is the trend. How does that temperature trend? So the fact that it's baselining right now at 126, we'll see how that temperature keeps up throughout the life of the experiment for how long, how quickly does it cool off. So the temperature degree difference, I don't really care about because I have a feeling when I turn this actively aerated pile for the first time, we get some water on it. I think those temperatures are gonna go up. That's my prediction, so let's get turning. A lot of steam coming out. Difference in coloration. So you definitely had this drier skin on the outside of the pile. There we go. The pile is now turned. You can obviously see the steam coming off of it. It's heating up. Nature's doing its thing. We had a darker, blacker color on some of the leaves that were on the inside of the pile. All stuff that's to be expected. Next step, we're going to add some water to these piles to fuel the microbial life. One thing I do need to be cautious about on this static pile is watering. Initially, my thought was all piles are gonna get the same amount of water, I'm just gonna count it off. But in thinking about that, that doesn't make sense because there's going to be different metabolic rates of the organisms in each pile, and those organisms are gonna have different rates of activity. So I need to be careful how much water I'm giving. All piles aren't using the same amount of water at the same rate, so it doesn't make sense to give them the same amount of water. And I think a static pile like this could work pretty well over time. The key is going to be moisture management because you could ruin a static pile or turn it more anaerobic than it normally would be by applying too much water. Why is that? Well, there's pore space being created in that pile and there's pore space inherently in that pile. 
that gases and water can go into. If you fill up all that pore space with liquid and moisture and you can press a lot of that organic material by adding weight of water to it, you're going to remove some of that pore space that gases can travel within. So I think you could have a static pile that goes maybe less anaerobic or a lower level of anaerobic if you're on top of your moisture. The goal of this pile isn't to force it to go anaerobic at all. That's not it. It's just to have a control. We're going to water it, not touch it, and see what it does. So I'm going to try and just gauge by feeling within the pile to say, how moist is this? Does it need water? Does it not need water? And I think just by doing that, I can reduce the degree of anaerobic conditions that could be present. At least that's my thought. We'll see how that actually plays out. After turning the piles and watering them, they cooled off to about 90 degrees. But fast forwarding ahead, it's actually five days later after the turn, so we're about 10 days into this experiment right now. And in checking the piles, the actively aerated pile is 102 degrees, the static pile or the passively aerated pile, excuse me, the passively aerated pile is 82 degrees. So passively aerated pile, pretty constant in temperature all along. Actively aerated pile, think about this. We got up to about 135 at the start when we built it. We turned it, it cooled off to 90. It got then up to about 120, 125. You didn't see that part, and now we're down to 102. I have another 10-ish days again before I have to turn, so we'll see how much more that pile cools off, and then we'll see if we get that initial bump again when we turn it the following time. So experiments playing out, stay tuned right here on this channel to follow along with the experiment. I will be doing a lot of update videos on this because I know the whole turn versus no turn thing is a big thing in composting. You can also follow me on Instagram at Diego Footer for more updates. But thanks for watching, thanks for playing along at home, and thanks as always for leaving your comments. Until next time, be nice, be thankful, and do the work.